Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O you most high. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You set us in the throne judging right. You have rebuked the heathen. You have destroyed the wicked. You have put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And you have destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken them that seek you. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth him. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change. And that was a reading from Psalm 9 about the goodness of the Lord, how he's going to be a refuge for us in the times that are about to come upon the earth because we trust in his salvation. Blessed are those who know his name and his name is above all names. His name is Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. And so today's teaching, oh, I'm just so excited because I have uh, like four different teachings that I want to uh, give out. So I'll probably be doing... Uh, you know, back to back teachings the next couple of days because uh, God is just so good because, you know, it's amazing how God reveals things to you uh, when you least expect it. Like uh, my pastor Hodges always says, he always has these wonderful quips. Uh, and he says, when you least expect it, you're elected. Hallelujah. And so uh, today I'm, I'm going to give uh, the new teaching that God just gave me today. Uh, because it's just so amazing. But I, I have a couple more on the back burner that I put on the back burner that I'm going to get out in the next few days. And they're also going to be good. Hallelujah. Uh, and God is going to be glorified, which is the most important part. And so God told me to feed his sheep. And so, hallelujah, uh, let's go to work, King Jesus. And so with this teaching, this revelation came about when I was uh, uh, listening uh, to the radio and that song by Kanye West came on called follow God. And so I'm not going to get into, uh, how people feel about Kanye West because I, that's neither here nor there with me. I, I don't got no heaven to put anybody in. I don't got no hell to put anybody in. Okay. So I don't get caught up in what he say, she say, what he believes. Okay. I don't know. Uh, only God knows, but I listened to the song. It came on the radio and it was called follow God. And when the song came on, I was listening to what Kanye was uh, talking about, and this lyric uh, came out of his lips, and he said, uh, wrestling with God, I don't really want to wrestle. 
And so uh, when that lyric came on and uh, in that song that he did, Follow God, the Holy Spirit went to work and all of this revelation came into my mind when he asked me, now what, what was Kanye West really saying? And I was thinking, I said, well, he said, uh, wrestling with God, but I don't really want to wrestle. And so uh, I, was, I was talking back uh, with the Holy Spirit and saying, you know, uh, well, Jacob did want to wrestle uh, with God. <laughs> and then right then, Right then, when Holy Spirit brought that to my mind, uh, he told me to go and study. Go and study Genesis chapter 31, 32, and 33, uh, uh, because I got some nuggets in there for you to see. And uh, uh, lo and behold, hallelujah, uh, God opened it up again with more revelation, because of course, you know, the premise of this channel is to talk about uh, the day of the Lord. Okay, that's why, you know, I always come on saying when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change because when the temple in heaven is open, that's when the day of the Lord begins because that's when we go up. That's when the voice is going to cry out, uh, which is the king's voice, Jesus Christ. He's going to tell us who are ready to come up here and we're going to go up into the father's house. Hallelujah. And then everything is going to change. Hallelujah. And so uh, because this channel is focused on end time prophecies primarily. Uh, and about uh, what's about to come on the earth. Of course, I asked the Holy Spirit, well, there has to be something in what you're telling me to go study about the end, because you tell me and you tell all of us who study your word that you tell us the end from the beginning and you declare from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will do all of my good pleasure. And so I've talked about uh, Jacob's trouble in uh, uh, what happened with Laban in other videos. But now God has showed me some more things because here we see in the whole story uh, of Genesis 31, 32, and 33, it's a whole blueprint of the end times. Hallelujah. And so I, I pray that uh, God would minister to you as you uh, buckle down and uh, uh, buckle up and uh, put your end time types and shadows glasses on and you let the Holy Spirit minister unto you for uh, our spirits are united because we share the common bond of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And so the same Holy Spirit that's in me, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the same Holy Spirit that's in me is in you. And so let the Holy Spirit testify. Uh, and let and let's let us be Bereans and let, let us uh, dig into the treasure trove that God has in His Word and pull out these jewels and gems so that we can uh, feast, Hallelujah! <laughs> so that we can feast on what thus saith the Lord. And so let's get to the teaching. I had this up here because we're going to be talking about what's going to happen at the time of the end. And so in Genesis chapter 31, we see uh, that uh, Jacob is in Haran, where you see this uh, red dot right here, Haran. That's where he had went to in order to escape from Esau. And Haran is where he uh, married uh, Leah and Rachel and the two concubines. Uh, and they had uh, all together 11 children. And so uh, we pick up in Genesis chapter 31, right here in Haran. And as you see, uh, Haran is on the other side of the Euphrates River. You see the Euphrates River right here, this Euphrates River. And so here goes Haran, and here goes, this is where Jacob is at. And now in Genesis chapter 31, Jacob is about to flee because it's going to be uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, and uh, let, let's get into the teaching. So here we see Genesis chapter 31, and Genesis chapter 31 is uh, titled, Jacob Flees from Laban. And so uh, Jacob has been serving uh, seven years for Leah, and then he served seven years for Rachel, which is a total of 14 years. And then he also served uh, six years uh, for uh, the cattle. And so 20 years altogether, uh, Jacob has served Laban. And so now Jacob is fed up. 
Jacob is fed up. Uh, he, it, 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 Jacob is fed up, and now he, he, he's going to escape. He's going to leave, and he's going to carry away his sons and his wives, and he's going to take them away from Haran. And we pick up right here in verse 17. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels, and he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting which he had gotten and paid in Aram, for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, and that he told him, not that he fled. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. Okay, so here we see that Jacob is fed up. He took everything that he's acquired in uh, Haran, where he labored for 20 years. And uh, now we see the end time shadow. This is the end time shadow that I'm going to bring out now. Uh, because this is God telling us the end from the beginning. And so we know at the time of the end, when the end begins, God is going to have a sacrifice at the river Euphrates. Uh, we see this here. Let me show you this. Because remember, uh, when Jacob uh, starts his uh, his... When Jacob starts to flee, it says that he rose up and he passed over the river. That river that he passed over is uh, the Euphrates River. And that is where uh, the tribulation will begin, hallelujah. Uh, when God intervenes into human history at the battle of Gog and Magog to shake terribly the earth and rain down hailstones and coals of fire in order to destroy uh, all the armies that come against Israel on that day. And God says that he has a sacrifice by the river Euphrates on that day. Uh, you see this here. So as we uh, go into the text, uh, we see in the book of Jeremiah how the day of the Lord is mentioned in connection with the day of his vengeance. And at the time of the day of his vengeance, God has a sacrifice by the river Euphrates. And when we look at this, pay attention uh, to the connection with Genesis chapter 31. Uh, because remember, God is telling us the end from the beginning. Here in Genesis chapter 31, when Jacob flees Laban, Jacob is going to back to the promised land. So he's going to inherit the promised land. Uh, the end times... The time of Jacob's trouble is all about uh, Israel and their right to the promised land and to the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And so uh, Laban is going to uh, be a type of the Antichrist. But there's just so much in this story that uh, let me get going uh, because there's just, I got to cover a lot of ground. Help me, Holy Ghost. So we see, again, doesn't want to repeat this real fast. Verse 21, so he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river, that's the Jordan, and set his face toward the Mount Gilead, okay? Now, pay attention to what we read in Jeremiah chapter 46. Jeremiah chapter 46, this is when, in the book of Jeremiah, God uses Jeremiah to pronounce judgment upon the nations, and this is the first chapter, uh, chapter 46, where the judgment begins, and it goes from right here in chapter 46 all the way to chapter 51, which is the destruction of Babylon. And this it's all tied together. But to begin with, let's start right here in Jeremiah 46, and you see verse 1, the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles. Okay, so let's jump down here to verse 9. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots. And let the mighty men come forth, the, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. So right here, we see the same nations that are connected with the battle of Gog and Magog. Ethiopia and Libya are also in Ezekiel 38 and 39, as well as Lydia. The Lydians, that's modern-day Turkey. Let me show you the map. Let me show you the map. Here goes Lydia. 
This is Turkey. As you can see, Turkey, Turkey. This is all Turkey right here. So Lydia uh, is modern day Turkey. And we know that Turkey is involved with the battle of Gog and Magog. So God is telling us that he's telling these people to get up. Come on. It's the time. It's time for war. Okay. He's, this is Gog and Magog. Okay. Uh, verse 10. And look. What happens when Gog and Magog comes, when they come for spoil, when they come to attack Israel? Verse 10, for this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. And look, look at the verse 11. After he mentions the sacrifice by the river Euphrates, verse 11, go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. So right here, after God mentions the river Euphrates and the sacrifice that he has, the next verse talks about go up into Gilead. Here in Genesis chapter 31, in God telling us the end from the beginning, when Jacob rose up to flee from his uncle Laban, he passed over the river and he set his face toward the Mount Gilead. You, do you see the connection? Okay, this is telling us an end time story. It's an end time story. And as we know, uh, back here in Jeremiah chapter 46, when the day of the Lord God of hosts begins, a day of vengeance, that is when Jesus stands up. Because remember in Luke chapter 4, when he took the scroll and he read from Isaiah uh, chapter 61. What did he say? When he read from Isaiah chapter 61, he said this in verse 16 of Luke chapter 4, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as is his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto, unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. So, Right when he got to Isaiah 61, verse 2, where it said, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. When Jesus read that, he gave, he closed the book, gave it back to the minister and sat down. Because that was what he was going to do when he first came. And that's what he did do when he first came. But we know that at the time of the end, when Jesus comes again, because now he has ascended back to heaven and he sat down because he's proclaimed the acceptable year of the Lord. We know that one day soon he's going to stand up. Hallelujah. <laughs> Psalm 110 tells us that. Let me just show you this right quick. Psalm 110 tells us that that was the psalm that Jesus always used in order to stump the religious leaders because they could not answer his questions about who is David talking about? How can uh, David call him Lord when he's his son? Okay, and we see this in Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so right now, Jesus Christ is sitting down on the throne, the right hand of the power on high, hallelujah, until he makes his enemies his footstool. And so when he makes his enemies his footstool, that is the day he stands up. That's the day he stands up, as we see in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 tells us when he stands up. 
It shows us when he stands up, when he takes the scroll, hallelujah. Revelation chapter five, here we see uh, verse six, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. This is when everything changes. This is when everything changes for everyone who's left behind. When the Lord stands up, when the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, when he stands up, what's going to happen? The rest of Isaiah chapter 61 is going to be fulfilled. Because after uh, the proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, what comes next? And the day of vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance. That's what comes when he stands back up, which is exactly what we see in Jeremiah chapter 46, when Gog and Magog come forth to battle against Israel. Well, actually, they come like a cloud to cover the land in order to take the spoil and to destroy Israel. But God says on that day, on the day of his vengeance, when the day of the Lord God of hosts begin, that is the day that God will have a sacrifice. He will have a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates, a hallelujah. <laughs> and then he says, go up into Gilead, hallelujah. <laughs> and so we see the connection right here in Genesis chapter 31, but this is just beginning, there's just so much more. I hope you saw that connection. I hope you see how everything is paralleled, how everything goes hand in hand, but that's just the beginning. Oh, there's just so much more. Let's go to work, Holy Ghost. Help us, Holy Spirit. Teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Oh, yours is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever and ever. You are the Most High. Hallelujah. So here we see Laban pursues after Jacob. And so here we see, okay, because remember, this is this is just the beginning. Gog and Magog is just the beginning, okay? Uh, Gog and Magog is just the beginning, okay? Okay, the, 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 oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Spirit. Gog and Magog is just the beginning, okay? Look at this, look at this. When, when God has this sacrifice, oh my goodness. When God has this sacrifice, oh my goodness, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, okay? Oh, do, do you, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm at a loss for words. I'm so excited. I'm so filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm about to jump out of my skin. My goodness, I'm so excited. Do you know, do you, do, do you understand, my goodness? goodness about this day about this day it, this is just the beginning my goodness it's just the beginning but oh the beginning is just so terrible the beginning is just so terrible okay look at this and look at this look at this my goodness isaiah chapter 2 <laughs> i'm sorry oh forgive me forgive me I, oh my goodness I, I'm like literally like, you know, it's just, I'm so excited. I want to teach this and I just like really want to scream at the same time. I'm just overjoyed and overwhelmed, filled with the Holy Ghost. I could just scream upon the top of the mountains right now. My goodness, help me, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't even contain them. My goodness. Goodness, God is good. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here we go. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 2. Oh, my goodness. Help me, Holy Ghost. I got to calm down because <laughs> I, this is all about to happen. This is all about to happen. Oh, this is all about to happen because God, he's about to stand up. He's about to stand up. And what happens when he stands up? What happens when he stands up? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 19. This is the sixth seal. The sixth seal, okay? And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. 
for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. When he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Okay. It's the day of sudden destruction, my friends. This is the day of sudden destruction. This is the day of battle and war. Job talks about what he has in his armory. Hailstones and coals of fire. Okay. This is when he stands up on the day of his vengeance, when the day of the Lord begins, when he stands up, when he arises, he will shake terribly the earth. Gog and Magog talks about that great earthquake. <laughs> it's right there in the scriptures. Everything on the planet shakes. Everything on the planet shakes. Everything on the planet shakes. Read it in Ezekiel chapter 38. I know you've read it before. It's the greatest earthquake in human history. It's God coming down on the clouds. It's the sixth seal. The same thing that we just read about going into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. That's what happens with the sixth seal. A great earthquake in people hiding who are left behind. Okay. From the glory of his majesty telling the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the one who sits on the throne. <laughs> it's God coming, okay? But it's just beginning. It's just beginning because look at this, verse 20. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. Yeah, everything is worthless after that. Okay, there's no more money. There's no more. There, there, all joy is darkened, according to the prophet. Okay. There's a crying for wine in the streets. Strong drink shall be bitter unto those who drink it. Okay. It's a terrible day, my friends. To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Okay, this is just, this is just Gog and Magog, okay, as well as the fall of Babylon the Great. It's all connected. It's the day of sudden destruction. Uh, before it all for before it all pops off, the rapture takes place. We go safely into the Father's house. But if you're left behind, you're going to be left to this. And if you survive this, if you survive this, which there's not, there's a there's a, a what a one in four chance. Okay, uh, uh, one fourth of all uh, the world is going to be given over to that pale horse. Uh, I guess that's not one in four. That's uh, one fourth of all the world is going. Uh, one fourth of all the world is killed by the rider on the pale horse, that fourth seal. Okay. And so there's not even a chance that you will survive this day when God arises to shake terribly the earth. But if you survive, here we go back to the teaching. Look who's coming. Laban. Laban represents the Antichrist. What, what is he called right here in verse 20? Laban the Syrian. Okay, so Laban represents the Antichrist. He's a type of the Antichrist, okay? And look at verse 22. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. Okay, so put your mind in the end time context, okay? Laban represents the Antichrist. And so what happens at the midpoint of the tribulation? At the midpoint of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 12 tells us. Revelation chapter 12 tells us what happens. When the dragon saw, Revelation chapter 12 verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth 
help the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we see that at the midpoint of the tribulation, the dragon is going to finally try to destroy all of Israel. But for those who obeyed what Jesus told those who were in Judea at the time when the abomination of desolation happens to flee to the mountains, to flee to the mountains, to take not anything out of your house, to not look back, to keep on running. God says everyone who's obedient at that moment in time, they're going to escape and they're going to be spared from the last half of the great tribulation okay and so we see a type of this here when laban uh pursues after jacob on the third day okay on the third day that midpoint here comes laban and laban is going to catch up with jacob because remember jacob is going to inherit the promised land Jacob is going back to inherit the promised land. And that's what the end times is all about. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. And the dragon does not want the promises of God to be fulfilled. He does not want Israel to inherit the land. Okay. That's why he sends Gog and Magog. Okay. But it's really God who's sovereign because God is the one who put hooks in the in hook. God is the one who's leading these people to battle. God is the one who put hooks into their jaws and leads them forth. He says, come. He says the same thing in Jeremiah as we read in Jeremiah chapter 46. This is all God's sovereign work. God is the one who's in control of everything. Okay. And so the dragon, okay, the dragon thinks that he's going to, somehow thwart the plans of God. But every step along the way, the dragon is always defeated. And so here we see the Antichrist, which is a picture portrayed by Laban. And Laban, uh, who is called the Syrian, because remember, the Antichrist is also called the Assyrian. And so let me just show you this. I just, I, I pray that you're, you're still following this teaching uh, because there's just so much. And so we see here, here goes Haran, okay? That's where uh, Jacob has fled. He's, he's crossed over the river Euphrates, and now he's heading down to the Promised Land. And so here comes uh, Laban, who represents the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist is also called the Syrian. And, and he comes from the north. He's also called the king of the north. Okay. And so Laban is a picture uh, of, of, of the Assyrian. As we see uh, right here, the Assyrian Empire. Look at the Assyrian Empire. Here goes Haran. Okay. The Assyrian. He comes from the north. We see the Assyrian mentioned in Isaiah chapter 14. The Lord had, verse 24, the Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Okay, so this Assyrian that's mentioned here, as well as in many other places, is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is, of course, going to be defeated at Armageddon. Okay, that's why he says he's going to break the Assyrian in, in, in my land. Uh, my land is, of course, Israel. And so we see that the Antichrist comes from the north. We know that from uh, Daniel chapter 8, uh, where it talks about here in verse 8, that the Antichrist comes from the north. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So this he-goat is, of course, Alexander the Great. And when he was strong, he died at the height of his power. And after Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four different parts. Okay. And verse 9 tells us something. Daniel chapter 8. And out of one of those four horns, 
came forth a little horn, which waxed great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, which is Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. Okay, so this is telling us where the Antichrist is going to come from. He's going to come from the north because when this little horn appears, he waxes great, exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So let's look at that Grecian Empire. Here goes the four parts, uh, Lysicomus, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And so we see something. Let me, let me, uh, somebody's calling my phone. Just hold on real fast. Praise the Lord. You know, it's, it's always amazing how when you, when you get to get into the details talking about the enemy, here he always comes with distractions. Okay. So let me get back on point. Uh, praise God. So we see here, uh, that Cassander, Lysicomus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy were the four horns that were, uh, taken, that took over from the great horn, which was Alexander the Great when he died. And so, uh, the Bible tells us in Daniel 8 that when the little horn appears, he waxes great toward the south, as you see my cursor, toward the south, and then toward the east, and then toward the pleasant land, which is Israel. So he could only come from the north. He's, he's called the king of the north. And so he comes from this Seleucus empire, which is exactly from where Antiochus Epiphanes came from which of course was a foreshadow of the Antichrist. He came from the Seleucid Empire, which is right here, the same area which is in connection with the Assyrian Empire. You see the Assyrian Empire, okay? That's why the Antichrist is called the Assyrian. So do you see how everything matches and, and, and melds together? And so as we pick back up with Laban, Laban is called the Syrian and he comes from the north and he chases after Jacob. Okay, he's chasing after Jacob, and Jacob is fleeing from uh, Laban, and Laban represents the Antichrist. And so what happens? Uh, Laban catches up to Jacob, and, and what, what happens between the two? Well, Jacob tells uh, uh, Laban that he's had trouble uh, for 20 years, verse 41. Genesis chapter 31, thus have I been 20 years in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your cattle. And you have changed my wages 10 times. Okay, so here we see a picture of the, the tribulation, Jacob's trouble. We know that Jesus told us that those days are going to be shortened, else no flesh would survive. So instead of 20 years, Jesus says that, the time of Jacob's trouble will only be seven years. And what happens when the Antichrist appears, when that little horn appears from the north, he's going to come with 10 kings, which is why Laban changed the wages of Jacob 10 times, which is a foreshadow of the 10 kings that Laban, uh, a.k.a. the Antichrist, is going to come with. Okay? And so we see that... Uh, God is with Jacob, okay, and the Antichrist cannot uh, uh, totally destroy uh, Jacob, okay, which is exactly what happened with uh, this interaction between Laban, okay, uh, verse 42 tells us this, except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely you had sent me away now empty, God hath seen my affliction in the labor of my hands and rebuked you yesternight. Okay, so it's only because God is with Jacob that the Antichrist cannot overcome Jacob. Okay, just as Laban could do nothing to Jacob. Okay, even though Jacob was fleeing, even though he was fleeing from the Antichrist, Jacob was fleeing from Laban. Uh, Jacob was in fear. Uh, it wasn't because there was any strength in Jacob himself. It was because the God of Jacob was with Jacob. That is why Laban could not touch him. Hallelujah. Which is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 12, as we read earlier, when the dragon pursues after uh, 
Jacob, well, Israel, he pursues after Israel and he cannot touch those who are obedient to the God of Jacob, which is Jesus Christ, because they will have at this moment in time when this event happens, they will have listened to what Jesus said in the New Testament. He, he told everyone who's going to be alive in the land of Israel at that time, when they see the abomination of desolation happen, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, do not come down to take anything out of your house, but flee to the mountains. Do not look behind you. Flee to the mountains. Everyone who's obedient to those instructions they will escape from the Antichrist. Hallelujah. Just like Jacob escaped from Laban. Hallelujah. And so remember, this is all a type and shadow. And so there, there, there's some more meeting here with the covenant with Laban. But I want to go to the next step because uh, we see something. We see, we see more meat when he, where, to where Jacob flees to. Okay, because here in Genesis chapter, uh, the next chapter, chapter 32, uh, here we see something. Oh, it's just so much. Praise praise you, Holy Spirit. Praise you, King Jesus. Praise you, uh, Heavenly Father. Holy, holy, holy are you. Hallelujah. Uh, Jacob uh, is now uh, about to meet Esau. Okay, and there's just, oh, there's just so much with this. There's just so much with this. And this is where all this revelation first started. Uh, from hearing that Kanye West song talking about wrestling with God and he didn't really want to wrestle. But here Jacob does wrestle with God. Oh, but look at the details before this. Uh, Genesis chapter 32, verse 1. And Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Maha Amin. And so here we see that Jacob has safely fled from the clutches of the Antichrist. And guess what? The angels of God are all around Jacob. Okay? The angels of God are all around Jacob because Jacob cannot be touched. Just as we saw in Revelation chapter 12 when Israel flees to the wilderness for the last half of the tribulation, the Antichrist cannot touch him. Okay? Because the angels of God have encamped all around those who have been obedient, who are of the seed of Jacob. Okay. And so we see a, a, a wonderful picture of all the angels of God uh, are uh, with Jacob. And Jacob says, this is God's host. And he called the place uh, Maha'anim. And so now we see where Jacob flees to because... We see a, a picture uh, in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel that those places uh, where Israel will flee to when they go to the mountains is actually uh, mentioned in Daniel uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 41. Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. And it's in the territory of, uh, of Esau. Uh, D Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. Here we see something. Okay. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Okay. So that's the antichrist. He's the king of the north. He's coming. Okay. And he's going to, he's going to destroy everything except verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land. He's going to enter into Israel, commit the abomination of desolation. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Edom, Moab, and Ammon is modern day Jordan. That's the place where the mountains are, where Jesus told everyone who was in Israel at that time to flee to. They have to escape towards Edom, Moab, and Ammon, okay, which is modern-day Jordan, uh, hallelujah. And so we see when uh, after, after Jacob flees from Laban, what happens? He goes into the land of Edom, which is where Esau is from, because Esau is Edom. Uh, verse 3, and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country 
of Edom. And so there's so much that can be said about this because Esau represents the flesh. Okay, Esau was a man uh, of the world. He, he represents the flesh. But of course, Jacob represents those who are filled with the spirit. Okay, and so uh, this is a struggle. This is a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit. Okay, and I don't want to go down that road with this. I want to stick on uh, this type and shadow of the end times. Okay, so verse 4, we see something. And he commanded them saying, Thus shall you speak unto my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob said thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and woman servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in your sight. Okay, so uh, verse 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We come to your brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet you. And 400 men with him. Okay, so here comes Esau. Esau's coming to meet Jacob now. And so Jacob, he's greatly afraid. Verse 7, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Okay, because remember, this is still all the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, this is, this is all about Jacob's trouble. And Jacob is still, uh, uh, he's still afraid. And now Esau, his brother, whom he had stole his birthright, and he hasn't seen in years, over 20 years, okay, now he thinks that Esau is about to kill him. Okay, uh, but look at this. This is a story about the end because who does Esau come with? He comes with 400 men. Okay, so there's a lot to this number 400. But one thing I want to point out is that 400, uh, the numerical value for that letter uh, is Tav. Tav is the final Hebrew letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, Tav, as you can see right here, is 400. And so what does Tav mean? What does the final letter mean? In the Hebrew alphabet mean, which is the numerical value 400. It means a mark, a sign, or a cross, ownership, to seal, a covenant, join two things together, the last, okay? Jesus Christ is the olive and the top. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so right here, this is telling us about the last. This is telling us about the end. This is a story about the end, okay? These 400 men who are coming with Esau, okay, to meet Jacob. 400 men represent the letter Tav, talking about something to do with the end, okay? And there's just so much about the end in this story, so let's keep on going. So as you can see, this is a story about the end. And so now Jacob, he's greatly afraid and distressed because he thinks that Esau, uh, his brother who he, who he hasn't seen in over 20 years, is going to uh, repay him for stealing uh, his birthright. Uh, but little does he know that, remember, in verse 1, uh, that when Jacob was on his way, the angels of God met him. Okay, so the angels of God are with him. He's safe. And that's exactly what we see uh, when Esau comes. Okay, but before he, before he meets Esau, what happens? Jacob wrestles with God. We see this in verse 22, Genesis chapter 32. Okay. Uh, so Jacob has, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. I forgot to mention this. Oh, oh, forgive me. Back up, back up, rewind, because this is also important. Verse seven, Genesis chapter 32, verse seven. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands and said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So what did Jacob do? He divided his family into two bands. What happened with Jacob? Jacob became Israel and Judah, two bands, right? Because remember, this is a story about the end, okay? But at the time of the end, those two bands will be one. Those two bands, Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom, those two bands will become one at the time of the end. And the flesh cannot overcome what God is doing in the spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> because Esau represents the flesh. Okay, but Jacob represents the spirit. That's why they were always wrestling from birth. Even in the womb, Jacob and Esau wrestled. Jacob and Esau wrestled in the womb. And uh, what, is, what is happening right, right now with us in the body of believers? We have this war going on in us as well that's similar to Jacob. Because we wrestle, 
not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The flesh and the spirit is always at war. Uh, those spiritual wickedness in high places tempts our flesh, but we have to die to our flesh. We have to crucify our flesh, and we have to let the spirit rule. Hallelujah. We can't sell our soul for a bowl of soup like Esau did. We have to surrender our lives to Jesus. Hallelujah. And let the spirit of the living God rule. Hallelujah. And so we see this struggle that Jacob had always endured uh, since the time in his womb. Because after he struggled with Esau, he struggled with Laban. And, and that's what we're talking about right now. The time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is the final struggle. Will the Jewish people, those who are called, those who are part of that remnant, they will finally realize. They will finally realize that the works of the flesh can never save them. They have to humble themselves and stop being like Esau and be Israel. Hallelujah. Which is what we see here when Jacob wrestles with God and God changes his name. Hallelujah. Oh, it's just so amazing. Verse 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the four Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except you bless me. <laughs> and he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Hallelujah. A prince with God. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray you, your name. And he said, wherefore is it that you dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Hallelujah. So this is an encounter with Jesus Christ, okay? Because this man that Jacob wrestled with was none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And so as we see in this story, Jacob would not let Jesus Christ go until Jesus Christ blessed him. That's exactly what's going to happen at the time of the tribulation for the remnant who finally realize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They will cry out, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will finally recognize their Messiah. And once they finally recognize their Messiah, they will be true Israel. Because not all Israel is of Israel, according to the Apostle Paul. But only those who have put off the works of the flesh, only those who have put down trusting in anything of their own sufficiency by offering up animals and doing all these rituals in religion, anyone who trusts in that for their salvation will not be called Israel. But only those who hold on to God only those who hold on and wrestle with Jesus Christ, only those who hold on to the skirt of one who is a Jew, which is Jesus Christ, only those who hold on and call on the name of Jesus and will not let him go, only those who did like Jacob will inherit the promises of Israel. As we see, because this is the night. Remember, they're wrestling through the night. Remember, the time of Jacob's trouble is when the night comes. The night when no one can work. And who appears? Who appears in the night? Who appears in the night and wrestles until the daybreak? It's none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. The one whom Jacob's trouble is all about. Jacob and all of his descendants who are part of the remnant, they have to hold on to Jesus through the night, through the nighttime. They have to wrestle. They have to wrestle. They have to wrestle. And they can't let go. They can't let go. They can't let go. They said, no, no, I will not let go until you bless me, until you call 
me by a new name. Hallelujah. <laughs> God is going to give us a new name. Hallelujah. And everyone who does like Jacob during the time of Jacob's trouble, they will be called Israel. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> and then what happens? What happens? After God changes Israel's name uh, from Jacob to Israel, what does Jacob ask God? Jacob asked God, what is your name? And then God says, why are you asking me what my name is? <laughs> God says, why are you asking after my name? <laughs> why? Because this is telling us about what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes. Because when he comes on the white horse, hallelujah, because this is a story about the end. What happens when Jesus comes on the white horse? When Jesus comes on the white horse, verse 11, Revelation chapter 19, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. <laughs> Why do you ask after my name? <laughs> I got a name that no one knows but me myself. <laughs> He's God, hallelujah. <laughs> He's God, hallelujah. <laughs> He's God, hallelujah. He comes with a name that no one knows but he himself. Why do you ask after my name, hallelujah? I got a name that no one knows but me myself, saith the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah. Oh, it's such a beautiful picture. It's such a beautiful picture. I'm, I, I just, I can't believe these revelations that just come out of nowhere. When you least expect it, you're elected. I had never seen it before, and it's just so wonderful because God is good. It's a whole story story of the end times but guess what it's not over Genesis chapter 33 Jacob meets Esau because remember Jacob is in Esau he's in the land of Edom okay the same place where all of the remnant will be at the time when Jesus Christ comes on the white horse okay they will be protected from that final three and a half years and what happens there's no fight between Jacob and Esau because Jacob is blessed. He's now Israel. He's dwelling safely in the land of Edom. And I can't go into the details right here, but I want to go into one detail and then I'll be over. Because look at this. Look at what happens. Because this is what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes on the white horse. Uh, verse 15, Genesis chapter 33. And Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in your sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way into Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth, and built him a house, and made boots for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Succoth is uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's Sukkot. What happens when Jesus Christ, when he comes, when he comes with a name that no one knows but he himself, when he comes at the battle of Armageddon, when he comes to rescue the remnant who is in the land of Edom, who have overcome the flesh, they've overcome Esau. Esau has no power over those who are walking in the spirit. And actually, those who are walking in the spirit are dwelling in the land of Esau because even the dragon can't get to them. Okay. What happens at that time? Jacob will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The last of the fall feast that will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And after they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, what happens? They inherit the promised land. Okay, they inherit the promised land, which is exactly what happens. Jacob came to Salem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he brought a parcel of land where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it Elohel Israel, God, the God of Israel. Oh, my goodness. It's just amazing. So 
we see that now all the promises of God have been fulfilled. The Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated, which is exactly what we read in Zechariah chapter 14. The Feast of Tabernacles is celebrated and the children of Israel inherit the promised land. Okay. The children of Israel inherit the promised land and the God, El, Elohel Israel, the God, the God of Israel is there amongst everyone who has been invited and part of the first resurrection. Hallelujah. Oh, it's a beautiful picture. I skipped over some things, but I, I hit the high points uh, by the grace of God because God is good. I pray that you were blessed. I pray that this spoke to you. Uh, the hundred pieces of, of, of money, uh, well, the number hundred in the, in, uh, the numerical uh, value for that letter is the letter Kuf, which means last, okay? which means last, oh, and there's just so much to this. So again, this is all telling us about what's going to happen at the end. At the end, this is an end time story. This was an end time story from Genesis chapter 31, 32, and 33. It's telling us all about the end and how Jacob will prevail and he will be called Israel. Hallelujah. And God, El Elohel Israel, God, the God of Israel, will dwell in the midst. Hallelujah. At the time when Jesus Christ comes on a white horse with a name that no one knows but he himself. And we will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which will fulfill the last of the seven feasts. Hallelujah. The Feast of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. It's just such a wonderful picture. It's the same story told over and over again. I pray that you saw it. I pray that the Holy Spirit ministered to you. I pray that, you know, my excitement, my enthusiasm for this did not overwhelm anyone because I, I, I really couldn't contain myself. I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, that fire is still in my bones. My goodness, I calmed down a little bit. My goodness, I was excited because, I, oh, you know how the Holy Spirit, he just, he just gets all over you and you just, you can't contain yourself. Literally. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't believe I really... I just wanted to scream from the highest mountain that Jesus Christ is coming. My goodness, hallelujah. Oh, you just know that excitement, that feeling, oh, that joy, hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, my goodness, let God be true and every man a liar, hallelujah. <laughs> I got to get off this. Oh, my goodness, I got to go pray. Oh, because God is good, my goodness, hallelujah. I, 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 I just marvel at his goodness. Because <laughs> this teaching just came all today from listening to a song by Kanye West about uh, wrestling with God. And all of this came about. It's just amazing how the Holy Spirit works. My goodness. Uh, I pray that uh, you will be best by this teaching and the teachings that I'm going to do later on this week, Lord willing. I pray that uh, God be with you and keep the faith. Jesus Christ is coming. Oh, my goodness. I love you. God bless you. Maranatha. Amen.